that you are ready to retire, that you've thought through everything that you need to think through, and that you're on your best path for a solid retirement? That is a good question. And it's one that I've helped hundreds of women and couples answer over the years that I've been a financial advisor. My name is Liz Whittaberry, and I am a financial advisor and the founder of Best Path Advisors here in Colleyville, Texas. And I have been in this financial industry since 1985. Early on, I decided that I wanted to focus on retirement planning. And I really do enjoy helping people, women and couples, take everything that they've worked hard for and put together a solid financial plan so that they have the confidence that they can retire and that they can do so securely. And so we look at building together an income plan, a tax plan, investment plan, wealth management plan, a legacy plan, a giving plan, a state plan, risk management, all of the things that go into ensuring that everything is working together. It's the most efficient, that it can be, it's providing the best results that it can over retirement and that you can retire securely, safely, and you, and you have that confidence going into retirement that you've thought up everything. And so I want to share today a plan that is based on the work that I do. Now, last month I did share a plan for a couple, like we called them Randy and Jenny, that had one and a half million in assets. And that was because there is a study that was done at the beginning of the year that said people think that across the nation, a lot of people think that one and a half million is their magic number to retire, that when they reach that, they'll be ready to retire. The people that I'm talking with tend to have anywhere from two million to 20 million. Uh, and a lot of them have uh, three and a half, four million or more. And so they want more than one and a half million to retire. This plan is going to look at a couple with between four and a half and five million, and that's going to be more representative of the conversations that I'm having with people, the questions that we're talking about, and how that retirement plan looks in retirement for uh, someone with that four and a half to five million. This is going to be Jim and Joan, uh, and so I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to look at uh, the plan for Jim and Joan, and uh, you know, my goal is that this will give you some things to think about. Now, Jim and Joan, as I said, have between four and a half and five million. We see 4.8 million in liquid assets here. I have not added any real estate into this plan at this point in time. Uh, and that's because we're not, we're not going to look at selling real estate or using real estate for any retirement income. We're just going to look at the retirement assets that Jim and Joan have saved and how does that support them in their retirement. Jim is 65, retired this year. He's an engineer and Joan is 64. She retired a few years back. She was a bookkeeper. They have a couple of kids, a couple of grandkids. They have saved well and so they do have, as I said, about 4.8 million in retirement assets. A lot of that is in their 401k, IRA, and deferred comp. So they have a lot of money that hasn't had any taxes paid yet. Uh, they did recently set up some Roth IRAs because they've been hearing a lot about Roth. Um, so they set those accounts up, don't have a lot in them yet. And so we'll look at, can they use those and how might that help? They are going to have um, social security in retirement and they're planning to start that at full retirement age. They do have a question as to whether that is or is not the best age to start it. And they need their assets to provide about $132,000 a year for their basic expenses. That does include some travel. And they want to do some extra travel early on. So from the point in time that they retire this year, all the way through when Jim is 80, they're wanting to have some extra travel built in. And so that travel is $12,000 a year. They do give charitably. They're going to need to buy health insurance because their companies have been paying for that. And they get a new car every five years. So they just bought a car since Jim was going to retire and they'll need a, their next new car in 2029. 
the program will calculate their income taxes. It's based on living in the state of Texas where we don't have a state income tax. Uh, if they were in a different state, that would change the whole projection because they'd have an additional tax cost. But it is going to calculate the federal income taxes. Uh, they are not saving. So they have, um, you know, they're retired. So they're not making any savings to any of their uh, accounts. And they're currently invested about 75 to 80% in equities. That's how they've been invested in their retirement plans, uh, 401ks and IRAs. And so they're wondering if they should be more conservative. Should they make some changes to that now that they're retired and not working? What should they do? So let's look at a plan for, for them. Um, and this is going to start by just saying if they don't make any changes, how does their retirement plan project out? And we see that it looks like they have, uh, you know, some decent growth over, over time. Uh, the accounts appear to be moving upwardly. And so that looks good. Now, if I change this to present value, so we see what are the dollars worth? What's the buying power of the dollars compared to today's dollars? Then we see that they're actually dipping into their principal a bit. But they're okay with that because they don't want to leave everything that they've saved to their kids and grandkids. They want to enjoy some of that in their retirement. So they do want to leave some, but they don't want to leave everything. And they want to make sure that they get to enjoy uh, some of that re money that they've saved, that they get to use that for themselves. Now, if we, I'm going to change it back to uh, the future value dollars. And we're going to look at their Social Security question. Should they wait until age 70 to, to take that social security, would that be better than starting it at full retirement age? Because if they wait, they get that 8% a year increase in the social security benefit. And that's a very good question. When I did the plan last month for Randy and Jenny, who had a million and a half in, in retirement assets saved, based on all of the pieces of their plan, it was better for them to wait. Is that going to be the same for Jim and Joan? You know, is that sort of the standard answer? You should wait. So let's look at that. If they wait to 70, they're going to have to draw down more from their assets early on. And then once they turn Social Security on, they'll have that bigger Social Security benefit. So then it begins to catch up. In their situation, because of the amount of money they have and the way that that is invested, if they wait to age 70, they actually never quite catch up. They've dipped into their balances and pulled money out for quite a number of years and all of the growth on that, they never cross over as far as their balance goes. So for them, it is not important to wait. Uh, they can go ahead and turn on Social Security at their full retirement age. Now, the other question that was their, you know, top of mind was, should we invest more conservatively? Because we're not going to be working and we don't want to see a lot of volatility in our portfolio. We want to make sure that we're protecting that uh, for ourselves. So if we look at their portfolio over time, and look at what is called a Monte Carlo simulation, which projects their spending, the income coming in, all the spending they're going to do over their lifetime, but under different market and economic scenarios. So it's going to project it out, simulate about a thousand simulations, and each one of those is going to have a different combination of good years, bad years, good economy, bad economy, so that we can see how might it turn out in different scenarios and know if they're on track to always have enough money to cover all their needs, no matter what might happen in the future. And they have an 86% probability of success the way that they're currently invested. And we see a pretty big gap at the end. That's because there's uh, a bit of volatility in those assets that they hold. If we look at the present value, then in today's dollars, it's between 1 million and 7 million uh, at the end. 
uh, 7.2 million. So that's, um, you know, that's pretty decent. If they were to um, become more conservative so that they could feel like they were maintaining the stability of those accounts, how would that impact that future growth in the plan? And if, if we look, if we say that they're going to reinvest their IRAs and 401ks and the brokerage account, they're going to reinvest those things that are invested in market assets into a more conservative portfolio, a more fixed portfolio that reduces their probability of success. It reduces the volatility in the near term, but they don't have the growth that they need to keep up with inflation over their lifetime. And so they end up dipping more and more and more into the portfolio to cover their needs and they have less than to continue to grow. So they don't want to get too conservative or they could put themselves at risk later in life of not having the money they need to support themselves. And if we assume that they're going to have higher taxes in the future, that our tax rates go up, which is a possibility because we certainly do have you know, a lot of things that are upside down relative to our budget and, and, and those things. So there could be higher taxes in the future. And if we assume that inflation is higher in the next 30 years than it's been in the last 30 years, we've had a very low inflation period behind us, but that may not be the case in the future. Um, well, then this more conservative portfolio does even more poorly. It can't keep up with the higher taxes, the higher inflation over time. And so we see that they have a much bigger chance of running out of money. So they don't want to get too conservative. If they leave it as is, uh, and we have those higher taxes and higher inflation, then they have a much better projection. They could still run out of money, um, but they're in a much better position to be able to make some adjustments. If instead they reinvest to a moderate risk portfolio, about the same average return that they currently have, but one that has lower volatility, then that will improve the situation. We see that that gives them a better ability to combat the impact of inflation, the impact of higher taxes that causes them to take more out of their accounts. They have a little bit better growth to maintain. Um, and it's partly because they have less volatility. And when you're in retirement and you're pulling money from accounts, the volatility absolutely matters. If you're having to pull money when accounts are down, then that's going to impact the future much more than, you know, you're just adding money. It's okay if it's fluctuating up and down. If you're not taking money out, that doesn't impact you the same because the money, the holdings are still there when the rebound happens. If you're pulling money out, then you've pulled the money out before the rebound happens and you don't get to participate in that rebound. So that is a reason that this lower volatility portfolio helps them with a better trajectory over their retirement years. And if we don't end up with higher inflation and we don't end up with higher tax rates, then having that low volatility portfolio that still has some good growth for the long term again, helps with the projection. We see that they they end up with a little bit higher probability of success and that the ending assets have a lower gap, that there's not as much of a gap between, um, you know, the, the top and the bottom of that future range. Now, that's a couple of good things to think about. They're going to wait they're going to go ahead and start their social security versus waiting, reinvest the portfolio to have lower volatility, be lined up with their retirement plan. But they still have other things that they need to be thinking about. And one of the big ones is the income taxes that they're going to pay over their retirement years. What's that lifetime tax bill going to be? Now, Jim's going to have a payment of his deferred comp. And I'm going to change this back to future value so we can see, you know, how this projects out over, over all the years. 
but that deferred comp payment is going to come in next year and that's going to be a big tax year. And if he had come in for planning, you know, early enough, then we might have been able to structure that differently where it's not coming out all in one year. But, um, you know, sometimes opportunities get missed. That's why I always say it's good to get a plan done. Look at your retirement plan five to 10 years before you retire, at least five years before, so that if there are some of these things that you need to know uh, that you could take action on to improve your situation, then you have some time to do that. Uh, but Jim is going to have that big tax payment here uh, coming next year when his deferred comp pays out. Then they have virtually no taxes to pay because they're using their savings. And then they will have required minimum distributions that kick in. Now, because we improved their portfolio and gave them lower volatility, which improves the average return of that portfolio, then they're paying a little bit more in taxes just because of that improvement. Uh, if they didn't make that change, then they would have less tax to pay, but they would also have less growth and a lower probability of success. So uh, they do want to go ahead and improve the portfolio so that they can have that higher probability of success. And so what can they do to bring this tax down over their lifetime? So we're, we're now looking at, you know, this same thing. Here they are with their 93% uh, probability of success, lifetime taxes of 3.8 million. What can they do to use uh, any opportunities they have to improve the tax situation? One of the things that they can do is change the way that they do their charitable giving to get more tax benefit out of it. And that's just a matter of restructuring the giving that they're doing to use either a donor advised fund or qualified charitable distributions and get the, the most tax benefit out of the giving that they're doing. That saves them about a hundred and um, I think it's 130,000. Yeah. About 130,000 in taxes in lifetime taxes. And so that helps with their lifetime tax bill. The other thing that they can do is use these years, these gap years where they really have no income tax to pay, use that to take some distributions from the tax deferred accounts, use those distributions to cover their income needs and take that in these lower tax brackets. They've got the 10% tax bracket, the 12 to 15% tax bracket, they can use those tax brackets to pay some income tax on that tax deferred money. And that will allow them to reduce the future required minimum distributions, which will then reduce those future taxes. And so we see that that also improves their lifetime tax bill. Beyond that, uh, you know, we want to look at where they're at as far as their tax bracket. And we see that further out, they're in the 32% tax bracket. Uh, that's when they're above that blue line, between the blue line and the green line, they're in that 32, 33% tax bracket. But earlier on, they're still below the blue line, uh, barely above the orange line, which means that they still have some room in the 20 to 25% tax bracket that they could use to pay some taxes at a lower rate than they would pay in the future. One of the things that they could do is Roth conversions. And the reason to do a Roth conversion would be to move the money from that tax deferred bucket into a tax free bucket. Because when the money gets into the Roth, then it's going to grow with no taxes. And once you've had a Roth for five years, all of the growth is tax free. It also will go to your heirs tax-free. They're not going to have to pay income tax on that Roth balance. So by doing that, we see that they save 344000 in lifetime taxes. Um, that's, that's a significant savings. And what I've done here is, is said, well, Joan will convert her IRA to Roth from the year after that deferred comp comes in, no point in doing it the same year as the deferred comp, but starting that next year until she has to start required minimum distributions. And then 
at that point in time, she would be taking her required minimum distributions. You cannot do a Roth conversion on a required minimum distribution. So if she was going to continue Roth conversions, she would have to take it over and above that required minimum distribution. Well, looking at the picture, we see that this pulls the future tax down to right at that blue line, but there's still in in the earlier years, when Joan hits required minimum distribution age and a few years after, there's still some lower tax bracket that hasn't been filled up. And so she could continue to do some more Roth conversions if they wanted um, and other things hadn't come up that they needed to spend the money on. And that brings their lifetime tax savings to 704,000. They still have a very good probability of success they're actually improving what they're leaving to their heirs. That's increasing because of this planning. And so that puts them in an even better position. Now, they don't really want to just leave a big chunk to their heirs and not use any of their retirement savings for themselves. I had said that earlier. And so in looking at this, um, the conversation would be, well, how much do you want to spend on other things that you want to do in your lifetime? And they do want to do some extra travel. So we're doubling the travel for the first 10 years. Um, that reduces that balance that's going to go to their heirs in the future, but that allows them to have that travel uh, early on. Now, one of the possible risks would be that um, one or the other of them pass away earlier. And we want to look at what that impact that would have. If, if Jim were to pass away at 88, and so that has him passing away here, and Joan continues to live to age 100, we see that there is a big tax cost because Joan is now having to file her taxes as a single filer instead of as married filing jointly. And so that increases her taxes significantly but if we've done this planning that we talked about, then she's in a much better position. She has put, she has ended up converting enough of her IRAs to Roth that when she's a widow, she has tax-free money that she can use to keep her taxes at a lower cost. And that is a significant improvement for her. Um, now let's look at what this does for the kids, uh, for the, you know, what, it, what the kids are going to inherit eventually at the last death. Um, how does this planning impact that? Cause they do still want to think about that. They don't want to pay unnecessary taxes or their kids to pay unnecessary taxes after they've done everything that they want for themselves and they've had a good retirement and enjoyed their retirement, they want to know that what they're leaving is going to be as efficient, especially tax efficient as possible for their heirs. And if they didn't do any of this planning with the tax planning, then their heirs would end up needing to pay about a million three in taxes. Uh, that's on the IRA balances uh, that still haven't had taxes paid. If they do this planning, um, the charitable planning doesn't impact the end. It impacts the taxes for Jim and Joan during their lifetime. But doing the income distribution, that does because it's allowed more of the taxable and tax-free to grow and they spend more of the tax deferred. So they've settled up on some taxes there. The Roth conversions, that is also an improvement because now they've settled up on more of the tax costs at the balances that are left to go to their heirs are uh, already tax paid. Those are those tax-free Roth accounts that they don't have to pay any taxes on. And then, of course, if they do that travel, they've spent some, of, some money uh, and that has a little bit less left to the heirs. So there's a little bit less tax to pay. If Jim passes away at age 88, then there's a little bit more tax to the heirs. And that's because Joan needs to dip into those Roth 
accounts during those years that she is a widow to keep her tax cost lower. So there's a little bit more left to the heirs, but it's still much more reasonable than what she would have, what they would have paid if none of this planning had been done. And so all of that gives them a very good trajectory over their retirement, a good probability of success, and a really good plan for how they're going to manage their tax cost, as well as how they're going to be able to spend more. Um, and, and they could probably spend even more than we're talking about. And that would be something that could be tested. So where do they go from here? So their next steps would be to think about the other things that they might want to do, knowing where they're at, knowing that they've got this baseline, knowing where the probability of success is coming in, do they want to do other things? Do they want to leave um, money to charities? Do they want to give money to their kids and grandkids while they're living when they can see their kids and grandkids enjoy that? Do they want to buy an RV and travel for a while? Or do they want to get a second property or any of those kind of things that people might want to do? What would they like to do? and test that out. The other thing that they need to do is test for other contingencies that could happen. Would one or the other or both of them need long-term care in the future? How does their plan support that? And should they think about um, any kind of adjustment in the assets that they have, or are they gonna be able to self-fund it? We don't have the real estate in here, so there is still that. And that's one of the things that we look at when we're talking about long-term care. Do all of their assets support the potential cost and still provide uh, some sort of an inheritance or money left over if that's uh, something that they wanna do. So those are some of the things that they could think about. And then once a plan is in place that gives them here's the cash flow plan that uh, is what you, what you wanna do, then the next step is to build out a bucket plan and look at how the assets are going to be invested and line up each of the different buckets with so that the proper assets are supporting the cash flow at the proper point in time. Um, and, and with that, talking about what are the guardrails that we would be looking at to know we should increase your spending or maybe we need to cut your spending back a little bit for a few years just to keep you on the best path. So those would be some of the next steps um, that they would want to take. And I hope that was helpful uh, and that that gave you some insight into some of the things that you should think about, some of the things that you can model out, and some of the additional things that you should model before you make a final decision on your retirement. Uh, beyond that, you have to look at uh, are you going to have any IRMA cost? And if so, when is that going to hit you? All of those different uh, questions. And that uh, is something that I build out in a different software that I have. Um, but I would like to say that if you have any questions, uh, you have any feedback, you can share with me on this, or you, there's other things that you would like me to model out and uh, share in future videos, send me an email. I would be happy to answer your questions. And I would be, I would love to hear your feedback. And if there's anything about your own situation that you have questions about, I'd be happy to answer that uh, for you as well. So this is my contact information. You can uh, reach out to me. Email is very easy, liz at bestpathadvisors.com. And of course, my website is www.bestpathadvisors.com. So look forward to hearing from you and I wish you a very happy rest of your day.